Hello everyone, producer Trent here. Slight hitch this morning. Uh, Helen's lost her voice, so she won't be joining us at all. And Robin's had complete Wi-Fi failure, so he's moving to a new location as we speak. There are two special guests in Africa. All their Wi-Fi is perfectly fine. It's all problems our end. So we're going to be on hold for about five, ten minutes, and then we will be live. See you in a minute. <music>
welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. Uh, we're slightly late. Uh, well, we're not. Everyone else was on time, but where I was, the uh, Wi-Fi crashed, which is why we're a little bit late. So I've just charged uh, down the street and up some hills to get some other Wi-Fi, which is why I'm even damper than I normally look from my normal middle-aged dampness. Uh, I will probably grow moss above this uh, limited beard that I have at the moment uh, as you watch, which, of course, in itself is a science experiment. So that is good. Uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, we're going to talk about primates, we're going to be talking about our relationship with them, we're going to be talking about them themselves without us necessarily being that involved, apart from obviously our observations. Uh, if you saw or heard uh, Infinite Monkey Cage, I can't remember whether it was last series or series before, we had a, a, a lovely episode um, with uh, Jane Goodall and Bill Bailey in which Jane tried to teach Bill how to speak chimpanzee because it turned out his dialect was appalling. And of course, Jane knows these things. And we also had on with us uh, Kat Hobater, who is incredible a new level of knowledge in terms of the complexity of language which exists uh, within uh, chimpanzee communities. So it's uh, we'll be talking about things like that. Uh, a few things to tell. We we'll also have Joe Setchell uh, with us as well. Um, and I will tell you all about their careers before I introduce them. Helen is not here because the continuation of things going slightly awry. Uh, Helen woke up to find that she had no voice whatsoever. Now, I personally, as someone who does a lot of work with the Slapstick Festival in Bristol, see no reason why she can't use a series of uh, kind of different cards uh just with you know various bits of bubble information etc um but she said it, it was better uh when she was mute not to actually appear on this but we will be at stand and calling hopefully uh festival next saturday at about midday uh where i'll ask be asking helen about oceans and uh also about trying to find new ways of communicating scientific ideas which sometimes have uh resistance towards them a few things to tell you if you can support us for our patreon that is fantastic Fantastic. Uh, Patreon.com slash Cosmic Shambles is where you can do that. And there's loads of extra shows that uh, are available to our Patreon supporters, including a series called Tips for Existence, uh, which the latest episode is Michael Pollan, who is a very interesting, I wrote The, the Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, Botany of Desire, and his most recent book uh, is uh, Your Mind on, This is Your Mind on Plants. Uh, and I had a long conversation, in fact, not so much about the book, but about his whole career and his changing relationship with both plants and consciousness and the overlap there. Uh, also, uh, next week, there is no Sunday Science Q&A uh, because uh, Helen's going to be um, at Latitude and I'm, I don't know where I'm going to be. Just wandering around in my attic as I have been for the last 18 months, I would imagine. Um, but uh, they're going to be doing lots of panels at Latitude on climate change, mental health, immunology. Tams and Edwards will be there. Uh, Susie Gage, Dan Davis, loads more. Uh, on Wednesday, there's going to be a live show from me, uh, which is I'm beginning to do my warm up gigs for Edinburgh Fringe 2022. Yes, I know I'm a relentless optimist to believe that it's going to be happening in 2022. And it's a new show called uh, A Billion Thoughts. Um, based on something that Frank Wilczek said. If you have any questions, ask them in the live chat or you can tweet them. Uh, Trent will make sure that I see them. Um, let's meet our guests for today. First of all, Kat, hello. Where now are you now? The last time, we spoke, last you time in... we spoke, you were in St Andrews. Where are you now? I'm currently sat in the middle of the beautiful Bodongo rainforest up in northwest Uganda. See, it's impressive, isn't it? I was in Birkenstead and couldn't get a Wi-Fi signal, and uh, you're in a rainforest in Uganda and have done tremendous. <laughs> Can I ask you a bit because I think we talked about this on, on, on Monkey Cage, or, or, or maybe we didn't get get round to it actually on air. But things like COVID, of course, mm -hmm. have huge implications, not merely for in in, in terms of, of of humans, but there is also the issue in terms of the primate communities that you you are monitoring as well, isn't there? Absolutely. So all primates are vulnerable to COVID. Lots of different animals are, but all primates are very vulnerable to COVID in similar ways to how we as human primates are. And we've been um, really worried about our ability to protect the populations from becoming infected and making some tough decisions at times, because while COVID represents a real risk to them, so um, chimpanzees that I work with here in Bodongo are probably just as likely to die from COVID as we could be. But COVID isn't the only thing that threatens them. And so if we had, for example, closed down all the field sites and kind of emptied everybody out and removed all the people from the forest, we might have protected them from COVID. But then we end up leaving them vulnerable to deforestation and poaching and a lot of other kind of issues. So 
Uh, each site, it's been really different. But here in Bodongo, we've just started to sort of tentatively have a go at restarting a little bit of research. Um, and I'm really glad that we're able to to do that in a safe way. All of our staff are now vaccinated and we have a lovely quarantine house where you get locked in for 10 days, nobody in, nobody out. Um, and then once you're through that, then you're able to move around with the chimps again. And we have been seeing here in Uganda just two or three times the level of um, logging and poaching in the forest, which is entirely normal because all of the communities in Uganda have been locked down just like we have been. And so they're going to fall back on the resources available to them. And unfortunately, that, yeah, that can that can lead some difficulties for the chimps as well. Lots, lots. Of are there in in terms of are there in in terms of diseases that because I I was thinking of what one of the the most tragic parts of, of both Jane Goodall's books and 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 also in some of the documentaries was the polio outbreak, mm. and so with most human diseases, is there is there a, a risk? I mean, would you just think like, well, hang on, we are so closely related. There is, you know, what is the, is is do we have a rough percentage chance? Is there anything which isn't communicated from uh, uh, one one species of primate to another? There, there might be apes in particular, given how closely related we are. A good rule of thumb is if we can get it, they can get it. If they can get it, we can get it in some form. Uh, and actually, um, somewhat bizarrely, we're very, all of the kind of things we've been doing recently, so wearing masks, social distancing, washing our hands all of the time, um, we've been doing that at the primate field sites for years because even just a regular cough and cold that, you know, makes you a bit sniffly can actually be lethal for some of the apes that we work with and a lot of the other primates too. And so it was this very strange kind of intersection of my two worlds when the things I was used to doing in the forest, which is wearing a mask all day, running around, worrying about respiratory infections and distances long before COVID suddenly entered the rest of my world when I was back in St. Andrews and, and for everyone else around the world. Now it seems almost now it seems almost a lot to ask you if you've got a show and tell when you are actually in a rainforest in in Uganda, which is a pretty big show in itself. Do you have a show and tell for us today? For you today, um, so my show and tell today is a leaf. <laughs> Now, I realise that since I'm currently sat in the middle of a rainforest, it might seem like I've kind of half assed my work a little bit, <laughs> but bear with me. Um, so chimpanzees are really well known for using tools, um, lots of different tools, different groups, different tools. Um, these days we know there's lots of different species that use tools, so Hawaiian crows make these amazing little hooked tools to go for insects and dolphins stick sponges on their nose when they're foraging about on the seafloor. But the descriptions that chimps not would only use tools but actually make their own tools were one of these moments in science where we really started to rethink what humans were and we could no longer be man the tool maker and all of that rubbish anyway. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about chimp tools though what comes usually to everybody's minds is sticks and stones and they use sticks for fishing for ants, for digging for honey, uh, little stone hammers for beautifully cracking open hard nuts and things and every chimp population from East to West Africa uses stick tools or stone tools, except for one. And that one population that has never in its life used a stick or stone tool, as far as we're aware, is Bodongo, which is where I'm sat right now. Um, so for a long time, we, were, we had to bear the brunt of a lot of jokes about our inability to use tools and being the, you know, kind of the, uh, yeah, the non-tool users of the chimp world and some various inferences about our chimps' intelligence as a result of that, which was entirely unfair, because I am here not only to defend the honour of my chimps, but also to tell you that leaf tools are amazing. They're the best tools. So our chimps will take a leaf and they'll fold it concertina style and use that to dip for water. They will make spoons. They will wadge a sponge up and use it to um, clean wounds or wipe something off their foot if they stood in something they didn't like standing in. Um, they use it for inspecting for insects, for um, a little whisk to whisk the flies away on a particularly hot day. Um, leaf tools are fascinating and there are so many different forms of them. But if you are a chimp and you drop a leaf tool when you're done with it, then basically what you do is you drop a leaf in a forest full of leaves, which means that as scientists, we know relatively little about them. 
Um, but that's our problem, and it has nothing to do with how interesting or useful or important leaf tools are. And I think everyone should get over their stick and stone obsession and embrace the leaf tool. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you. We've got loads of questions. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got loads of questions for you. Uh, and uh, obviously for Joe as well. We're joined by Professor Joe Setchell, who's a primatologist at Durham University. University and also president of the Primate Society of Great Britain. Uh, Joe? Uh, you're also somewhere uh, that is not, you're, 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 you're not just in Durham at the moment. No, I'm in southwest Gabon in Central Africa. And you are involved in uh, a Saving Primate uh, project out there at the moment. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so um, I've been coming here to Franceville in Gabon for uh, 25 years now, um, mainly as a researcher to work on a particular species of monkey um, who are fabulous and they live here. They're, they're just wonderful, fascinating. Um, but it isn't possible to spend a career working on primates doing research without becoming acutely aware of the extinction crisis. Um, so I'm not here to work on mandrels this time, although I do go and see them as much as I can. Um, I'm here to work with an organization called Save Gabon's Primates, which was founded two years ago by my um, colleague and hero, Dr. Barthélemy Ngubangoy, uh, who is Gabonese. Um, and we're dedicated to primate rehabilitation, welfare, conservation, and uh, human primate relations. Um, so we're based here. Um, and the history of the organization is that until Bart became head of the Primate Center here in Franceville, the Primate Center was a biomedical experimentation center um, to do biomedical experiments on primates. And Bart is the first Gabonese director of that centre. And when he took over, he put an end to all of the experiments on primates and turned the centre into a rehabilitation centre so that we can rehabilitate the animals who were involved in experiments um, and also take on orphans uh, relating who, who um, come from hunting. So there's a lot of primate hunting here in Gabon. Um, and when parents are killed, baby primates are left and often kept as pets um, in some pretty poor conditions, sometimes in nice conditions, but living with humans. And they really need to be living with primates because primates are social species. Um, so we take those primates on, on re-socialise them, check their health, improve their health if we need to. We usually do um, re-socialise them as primates and eventually release them into the forest so they can uh, rejoin the life that they were born into. Um, so that's what we do. But what, what I'm here for right now is that we um, are having a, a, a strategy session. So we're planning our, our strategy for the future. So our aim, our vision is to be a centre of reference for primatology, primate veterinary science, conservation and human animal relations. So we're strengthening our links with local universities and with the National University, so we can bring sociologists and anthropologists in, um, so we can promote cross-cultural understanding, inform conservation efforts. Um, and so the point we want to make is that Gabon is home to very large populations of wild primates. It's still 80 for 80 percent rainforest here in Gabon, isn't it? It's a fabulous country, incredible biodiversity, great hopes for conservation if we can get it right, um, but only if we get it right. Um, and we think that centres of excellence in primatology should be in countries where there are primates, non-human primates, um, not in Western. I and mean, they can also be in Western Europe and North America. I'm not suggesting they shouldn't be, but they shouldn't only be in the North America and Western Europe. Um, and I think the travel restrictions around the pandemic have really shown that because if projects rely on the presence of foreigners and foreigners can't travel, then the projects completely uh, fall to pieces. So. Um, I'm really excited and really happy um, to be involved in this important move towards decolonizing science. Where's the best place that people can go to read up more about this? Uh, we have a website, Save Gabon's Primates. It's currently in French. Um, one of my jobs is to do the translation, um, but it's Save Gabon Primates, Save Gabon's Primates .org. Um, Information, pictures, we're on Facebook. So you can follow us on Facebook, again, usually in French, but again, I'm going to be translating all of those posts. Um, so there's information about the animals that we house, animals in Gabon, um, the people involved, all that sort of thing. Brilliant. And do you have a show and tell for us this morning? Well, that really, yeah, I do. But um, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> can you see oh, this? Is... Right in front of your face, just for a moment. If, if you, there we are. Yeah, we can. Yes. 
<laughs> so there we are. It's it's publicity for Save Gabon's primates. This is my drinking goblet. <laughs> Excellent. That's I, I love the fact you know that just reached out and grabbed some leaves that were hanging around and made up a story you just got <laughs> out of um uh we've got loads of questions i'm also going because i'm not using the normal camera i've realized so i'm just going to quickly just clean my camera there a little bit because this is not the normal one i'd be on there i realized that it looked like i deliberately smudged it to make myself look younger uh in one of those uh, 1970s film stars and let's get on with we've got loads of fantastic questions as i said if you have questions as well we take live questions so do just put them in the live chat uh or tweet us. Uh, let's start off with Nick said, uh, I would like to know, when it's said that uh, chimpanzees can understand us, what exactly can they understand? Is it uh, simple cause and effect they're learning or are they capable of understanding our intent? Now, of course, there's been so many different studies on this. I wonder, uh, and, and so many different takes. So, Joe, should we start with you on that? <laughs> um, yeah, so the this is, this is probably with cats area more than it is um, mine, actually. But I yes, I'm pretty convinced that they can understand intent um, based, I think, on on um, Franz de Waal's um, point that we're very, very closely related. It would be strange if we didn't share that. I think we start from a, a, um, a hypothesis that we do share traits. And then if we don't, then that would be a surprise. Cat. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. So I think, you know, let's just get over this idea that humans are some sort of exceptional kind of different species, like every other species in the world. If you have a close biological relative, then you're very likely to share an awful lot of those capacities. And we are very, very closely related to other primates and especially chimpanzees and bonobos are our sister species. Um, and so my own work on communication suggests that they certainly are very capable of understanding each other's intent. Um, but studies that have been done on captive apes, where you've got the interaction between humans and chimpanzees or humans and other primates in general, also show that they're very good at communicating back and forth, at requesting things, at understanding what you're getting at. Even if you're making a mistake, they might modify their communication a little bit. So um, there's a lovely study by um, Dick Byrne and Erica Cartmill on orangutans, where they were gesturing to their zookeeper and their zookeeper had two piles. Uh, one was cucumber, one was bananas. And anybody that knows an orangutan knows they want the bananas, not the cucumber. And the zookeeper would do one of two things. He would either give them one banana or some cucumber or actually all the bananas. If you give them all the bananas, they stop gesturing, nothing else needed. If you give them one banana, they're going to keep gesturing with the gestures they were using because that kind of works, but you just haven't done everything they were after. And if you give them cucumber, then probably apart from them throwing it back at you, they will completely switch their gestures. And the lovely analogy they made is that this is kind of like a game of charades, right? So if you're um, asked to describe Star Wars and you're sort of doing all of your kind of, you know, gestures and things in charades and people are coming up with other science fiction, you might just persist and use the same ones a few times while they keep guessing. Someone turns around and says, you know, well, is that um, Downton Abbey or something way off the mark? Then you're just going to scrap those gestures. They're clearly not working and start again because you have an understanding of what their intent was, but also what you need to do in that back and forth of communication. And it looks like apes are just as capable as we are of that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, the next question is for both of you. I'm going to start with you, Kate. This is a tough question. This is from Joe. She's six years old. Uh, hello, Joe. Uh, Joe wants to know, what is the best monkey? And I think, <sighs> have both, I think we will have uh, best monkey and best ape. So uh, obviously this is uh, within lots of different parameters and in terms of just the, 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 the wonders of watching different forms of, of, of behaviour. But I know this is going to be a tough one. Uh, Kat. Oh, that is a tough one. I'm going to have to whisper this really quietly while I'm sat in this forest because I love chimps. They have been my life for many, many, many years at this point. But a few years ago, I got to start working with the mountain gorillas. And oh, man, they are the loveliest primate to spend time with. They're nice to each other all the time, which the chimps are definitely not. They're relaxed. Their kind of life goal involves generally eating, cuddling and tickling each other and then having a very long nap for the day. And they're just, yeah, they're they're really, really wonderful. And I've had the best time getting to to understand a little bit more about their world. So I might have to go mountain gorilla this time. 
Joe. So I have two answers. First, it's the last monkey I saw because that that's usually how I work. I just get so excited about whatever it was I saw. Um, but I have to say it's mandrels. Mandrels are just fantastic. They have a red stripe down their nose, blue stripes on their cheeks, a pointy yellow beard, huge teeth. That's the males. The females are colourful. Juveniles are just adorable. So I think mandrels are the best. Brilliant. There we go, Joe. That's a, that's a starting point. I'm sure you will have uh, a, a, another choice. But it's all it's always so. I know Steve Baxter always has a problem where he goes, I don't really have a favourite because, as, as you said, Joe, it's, it's the latest thing you've seen, or it's just these little, all of these beautiful little details. I wonder, have did I have either of you read um, Eugene Murray's, um Soul of the Ape, Joe? I just I just yeah. want because that is such a. I know that wasn't published until the late sixties, but that seems to be. Even though I know it's not an ape, it's actually a monkey that he's 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 studying. He does that with the soul of the white ant, where it's actually termites as well. But the rest of that seems to be a huge changing part. And obviously, Jane Goodall had actually started a work before that was published. But that sense of living properly within a, a community, getting a sense of of not just that's monkey A and that's monkey B, and and the naming. Uh, that seems to change our ability to to understand other species. Yeah, yeah. I think um, one of the I, I'm I mean I'm incredibly lucky that I still get to spend about six months a year in the field. And one of the things I love is that I a I learn something new every single day I go into the forest. But also, I get this sense of it's like the long running soap opera of their lives, and I get to see. Um, all the little tiny behaviours that actually in six months time when there's a massive alpha takeover and the big drama happens, I get to think back and go, oh, hang on a second. There was that day when those two chimps were grooming and it was kind of it wasn't usual or something. And you see that kind of soap opera and drama and half of it is not big drama it's the little subtleties of who's hanging out with who and where they've gone for the day and what happened and who reacted when somebody kind of came over and made a bit of a kind of social faux pas or something or getting to see little ones kind of grow up and then realizing as adults that some of the experiences they had as kids are shaping their behavior as adults in, in really interesting and different ways and the, the more time you spend with them the harder it is to um to try in any way and sort of say, you know, humans are fundamentally different on characteristic A, B and C, because every time we come up with a new one, then there'll be some observation that just rubs out that line in the sand. Brilliant. Thank you. This is now this is another tough question in terms of because it's the inner mind that we're looking at. This is our Arjun was wondering about about uh, uh, the current understanding into primate consciousness and levels of self-awareness. Now, this is, of course, such an interesting one because I've talked to, to, spoken to some neuroscientists who kind of say, well, there's different levels of consciousness within human beings, let alone once you start. to. So um, I'll start again with you, Kat, if that's OK, just to, that that sense of, of self-awareness. How have we changed? Our ways of of testing this because it used to just be mm. popping a spot, didn't it? On a on a forehead was the was the system. It's called the mirror self recognition test, right? So if you looked in a mirror and you saw um, another face in that mirror, do you recognise that that's actually your face looking back at you, or do you react as if it's a, a stranger or another kind of another concept, and somebody else in your group or something like that? Um, and so this ability to recognize yourself as an individual being one of these kind of thresholds that they used. But there's lots of different ways in which um, animals can fail that test, not because they don't have consciousness or self-awareness, but because maybe that's not a very relevant thing for them to pay any attention to. Um, I mean, there are lots of I mean, we've been looking uh, recently at how chimps might be able to tell who's related to who and signals for things like kinship and so you know family you know do you look like your dad do you look like your little brother or your mum well one of the ways that um we think we know what we look like in humans is by looking into a mirror but mirrors are, have only been around for a few thousand years in humans kind of you know we haven't fundamentally changed our minds and our cognition over the last couple of you know even over the last probably five or ten thousand years and that's you know long um before mirrors were turning around so I, I don't think that it's necessarily a great way of capturing it but it is this really difficult question of how do you ask 
I mean, we make lots of mistakes about what other people are thinking all the time. I make lots of mistakes about what other people are thinking all the time, at least, and hopefully it's not just me. And so finding out what somebody else is thinking is really difficult in humans. And doing that in another species relies on on usually just seeing lots and lots and lots and lots of ways in which they respond to something. And if that pattern of behavior is similar, perhaps, to the way we do, then then why not assume it's founded on the same the same underlying mental principles and things so yeah lots of lots of good reasons to to suggest that they have an awareness of themselves that they have an awareness of other individuals and other minds so um tracking sort of you know i not only what do i know but do i know what you know do i know that you know what i know um all of those kind of theory of mind studies that you can really start to pick it apart i think there's beautiful evidence now coming out across lots of different species that they're capable of it Joe, what about you? Do you have you had a, a changing thoughts in terms of the levels of uh, of, of self awareness in 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 some of your studies? Um, yeah, and it, maybe it follows an interesting trajectory because I think it it goes with training. In that, I think we start out assuming that, of course, animals are self aware and and have the same level of consciousness as we do, because we often live with animals. And we attribute them consciousness every day, easily. When I know my cat has consciousness, there's not a que- there's no question there that we interact with one another and that she tells me what to do and I get it wrong. Um, but then when we train as scientists, suddenly we're told that you know, you've got to you've got to be able to show this experimentally, otherwise it isn't there. Um, and so then I, I took that on board and I became quite a hard scientist. Um, and then gradually moved out of that again. I think as you become established and are allowed to perhaps to have your own voice more rather than needing to follow what happens, um, it, I'm now more persuaded by um, actually what social anthropologists do in ethnography and the fact that you hanging out with animals is the way to find out how they how they are. Um, and I was quite struck when Kat was talking about um, understanding people. So we have more difficulty understanding other groups of people than we do understanding our own. And I think then then there is a continuum then between other groups of people and then moving perhaps to other species. And so it takes a long time. So I understand mandrels pretty well, even if I haven't seen them for a long time. You know, I immediately know if I approach the mandrels and they shout, I know exactly what they're shouting about. And if they perform a particular gesture, they turn around and show me the side of their leg. I know exactly what they want. They're saying hello and they're saying, I'd like you to scratch this bit of my leg, please. Um, And they only say that to certain people. So, you know, they're picking me out. They remember me or they remember someone who might have smelled like me. Um, So, yeah. Brilliant. Now, Kat, you've partly answered, well, you've at least answered this in terms of orangutans, but perhaps not a uh, uh, monkey. Joe would like to know, do monkeys actually like bananas or is that just in the cartoons? <laughs> uh, they certainly seem to like them if they get them, but it is not something that most apes and I don't think many monkeys um, would eat naturally in the wild. So... Um, it's not a normal part of their diet, but there are lots of things that are not a normal part of our diets and we're quite keen on them when we get our hands on them. Um, so yeah, lots of things that, um, that they will eat, but that's not one of the things that is normally something they eat. Brilliant. This is, is, uh, the question from Michael. This is, uh, I'll start with you on this, Joe. This is, uh, we're getting genetics now. What is the current thinking on the time when, uh, apes and humans diverged? I suppose we should say other apes and us, because in some ways we, we, we are still, we're still an ape, aren't we? Aren't we still oh, an ape? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. question. Um, in terms of that diverging, so I, I presume was was the, the 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 last common ancestor as we go up that tree would that have been one shared with with chimpanzees? With chimpanzees and bonobos because they split more recently than we did. Um, so estimates vary between I think five million years ago would be the really really kind of closest time, and it maybe goes up to ten. Some people would still argue for further back than that, but. I don't want to get this wrong, but I think most people are settling around seven, some seven million years ago for the split between humans and chimpanzees and bonobos. 
And then chimpanzees and bonobos continued um, and split much more recently than that, perhaps, I think, two million years ago. Is it still true in terms of, of more recent research? I, I always read that bonobos were far more kind of basically relaxed than chimpanzees and, 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 and far less at times uh, warlike. And we read about all these different things of the use of kind of sexual behaviour just to get rid of arguments. So is that still, I mean, I, I realise that some of the books I've been reading are 30 years old and that's a long time in, in, in these studies. Um, is, is that still considered uh, generally true that in, in terms of the difference in, in I suppose, levels of of, uh, of of kind of violence in in their behavior okay um yes and no i suppose um so one of the reasons that there was that exaggerated picture going on is because most bonobos had been studied in captivity which does all sorts of strange things to their social system um and most chimpanzees that had been studied long term were often East African. Do seem a little bit more pre afterwards. Um, but we're now looking and we have much better data on, for example, West African chimpanzee populations who are mm, probably more bonobo-like in their tendency not to kill each other, not to be particularly violent. They're still very territorial, but I was, I've was i spent a bit of time with West African chimps recently and they'll sort of meet and have a good shout at each other and then just chill on the ground. <laughs> and that seems to be that, which to me, I mean, when I see an inter-community encounter here in, in, in East Africa, it's, it's really stressful. I'm basically waiting to find out if anybody's going to make it out of there alive. And so I think the difference between chimps and bonobos is... Um, not as great as we used to think and it's more that um, there's lots of different so east african west african chimps are different west african and bonobos are more similar um, and one of the things about bonobos too i mean chimps have they have the very um, aggressive tendency which can include killing each other but they're also incredibly cooperative and collaborative they go hunting together they will defend each other to you know to, they'll put themselves at risk if somebody else is attacking somebody that's a friend of theirs or a family member and one of the flip sides with bonobos is you do get a little bit more pro-social sort of you know they they will if they meet the neighbors then they're as likely to have sex with them as anything else but also you don't seem to get quite as much of the other end of the spectrum. So maybe bonobos live somewhere in the middle. And one of the features of being really strongly socially bonded is that therefore you have an in-group and an out-group. So you've got competition, but you've also got these incredible social bonds in your in-group that lead to all sorts of interesting things. And it just might be that bonobos live in a, in a very different kind of world in that respect. Thank you. Um, this is a, as Andrew says, who has this question, he says this is a uh, perhaps controversial and a big topic, but he just wondered from both of you, uh, in terms of having worked in the field with wild animals, what are your thoughts on keeping large animals like apes, elephants, etc., in zoos? He says, I personally flip flop, and I'm uncertain whether education and conservation uh, trump some of the other thoughts. So, Joe, starting with you, because I know there's been a, in the last thirty years, in particular, it seems there's been a huge change, and we we saw that very specifically in in London Zoo, I think, with the change of management and. and and ideology in the early 90s. What, what are your thoughts on, on the use of zoos? Um, so I'm going to concentrate on the question about apes, I think, because I don't know enough about elephants. And elephants range so widely that must have an effect on them. Um, but I, I think, basically, I also flip-flop. Um, because I know so many primatologists and primate conservationists and people who are interested in primate conservation, which is so important, who were in zoos. Um, so that I do understand. But at the same time, when you have seen animals in the wild and hung out with them in the wild, it's very, very difficult then to imagine them in them, even in the best zoo. Um, so I think I flip flop. I know a lot of people who work in zoos. Uh, and I think the same sort of question goes with captive um, facilities that keep animals for um, research purposes. I don't mean biomedical research, I mean psychological type research. Um, I think I probably would go out on a limb there and say that we don't need to do that because it doesn't have so much of the education and conservation um, impact. But it's difficult. 
It's interesting. I, I was talking to my I was talking to my friend Andrea, who who does a lot of work in the fields. So I was in in Rome Zoo a while ago, and in their their baboon enclosure, the, they looked ill and they they had chunks of their hair coming out. And she said, "What what uh, what, what were they in?" I said, "It was kind of a pit." And she said, "Yes, looking down on them, even that alone is something which is that that design would have to be changed because it has again when we talk about consciousness, that realization of 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 a, a, a mental life, of an internal mental life that that can." So so so, Cat, what, what how do you feel about this situation? Not the situation in Rome Zoo, because I think I can I presume what your feeling is about that. Um. Yeah, I, I, like Joe, it, there's no there's no easy answers here, and it, it doesn't matter. I mean, primates are fundamentally social creatures, and there's almost nothing that you can do that that recreates in any meaningful way what their life would be like in the wild. I mean, look look at what we've all just gone through in the pandemic in terms of our social isolation and living apart and not being able to connect with individuals, and just how stressful that has been, and how how fundamentally kind of impoverished I mean, for those of us who've been incredibly privileged to live with you know in a comfortable house with a good job and not worry about food but being isolated which just that's 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 really detrimental to any primate's welfare and well-being so it's very hard for me to see primates in zoos having said that there are very very few cases where you can ever release them back to the wild because usually when you have been born in a zoo that's the life you know and I can tell you I've lived in a rainforest for about 20 years I make a halfway decent chimpanzee but I'm not very good at it like this is not the kind of thing that I regularly you know make a mistake and muck up their hunt because I broke a branch on the wrong moment or something you know there's all sorts of things where this is not easy to learn once you get to a certain age and so we have these primates and zoos. We need to make sure that, and there are lots of people who are incredibly passionate about looking after them as best they can. I think for me, what's really important is that their welfare and well being should come first. And that means, for example, having areas and enclosures where they can choose whether or not they're on view to us. So, um, you know, and that gives you maybe this better sense of actually. You know, I I would love the idea that more of the kind of zoos are more of a kind of wild fieldwork experience where you go and you just have to sit quietly and be patient. And then those glimpses you get of the animals are so much more special. And it's not just about them being on display for us. If their welfare comes first, then I think then that's probably the best solution for the individuals that we've got left currently in zoos. Thank you. Uh, question. Uh, question for you, Joe, from Lawrence. Are mandrills colouring uh, there to scare predators? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think so. But having said that, I don't think anyone's ever tested it. But we do know that it works within the species of mandrills. The colour works uh, to communicate. So a bright red nose, nose it means a dominant male. And that means that he's scary to other males and probably attractive to females. Brilliant. And I should say, anyone watching this, by the way, if you're a comic book fan as well, fan as well, look up Alan Moore uh, with his face painted as a mandrill. It's one of the most magnificent pieces of facial art you will uh, see. Uh, now, uh, one one for you, Cat. This is uh, from Cassie. Cassie would like to know: Are primates modifying and improving tool behaviour? I mean, I suppose this is hard to know because you're still <laughs> you don't know what you're missing, do you? In some way, so you might presume it's modifying. So, sorry. Yeah. Great question. So I think there's there's a phrase that all of the um, the researchers that study this get very hooked on called cumulative culture. This idea that you do something and you make a tool, and then the next generation to use that tool maybe modifies it in another way, in another way, in another way, and we go from having a sort of basic kind of hammer that's a stone to crack something to a very sophisticated sledgehammer or a drill or something in the future. But we've seen a fraction of chimpanzees. I mean, chimpanzees live for 40 or 50 years. Um, so the longest running field sites for chimpanzees that have been studying them have been running for about 50 or 60 years. And we, you know, that's that's a fraction of a kind of um, snapshot of their lives and their kind of abilities. So we... We don't see any evidence for it at the moment, but we don't know what went before. And we probably have to go a really long way back. The, the guys, at, um, there's a group at Oxford who had, um, 
leading this new field called primate archaeology, where they're basically doing excavation of primate tools back in the day. Um, and so far, it looks like the primate tools being used thousands of years ago are quite similar to the primate tools being used today. But we could have said the same for humans for tens of thousands of years of our history. It's only really in the last couple of thousands of years that we've changed so dramatically. Stone tools were stone tools for a very, very long time. So that's not to say they don't have the capacity to, but maybe their tools are pretty good at what they need them to do right now. Thank you. Uh, here's another one for you, actually. This is from Francisco. Do apes do comedy? Do they have jokes? <laughs> uh, oh, man, I would. Um, I'd love to know the answer to that question. Um, apes laugh. So you get something, well, you get something like laughter and they produce it when they're being tickled and when they're sort of apparently happy and playing and therefore it seems very much like laughter. But on the flip side, I've never seen, so uh, it's going to sound terrible given, you know, um, so all sorts of toilet humour. Um, this morning, the chimps were eating an awful lot of fruit. That means they had terrible gas and they were farting their way through the forest steadily and here on my focal recordings for this morning that i am snickering in the background like a five-year-old because it's impossible not to laugh when somebody farts really loudly next to you i've never seen the chimps do that and even when somebody takes a pratfall and they trip over trying to drum on a buttress or all sorts of things where that sort of involuntary kind of laugh just emerges out of us i've never seen chimps respond that way so either they find it hysterically funny and they're much better than I am at keeping a straight face or I don't recognise whatever their it's funny signal is. But I haven't seen anything to suggest that they have that sort of sense of humour. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to know the answer to that. I think I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember, I think in, in Darwin's, it might be descent of man or it might be expression of emotion in man and animals. He talks about an anecdote of a, a sailor who was known for kind of bullying the monkeys on an island. And then one of them apparently had just collected an enormous pile of dung. And as yeah. he to his ship, just threw dung uh, at his head uh, with tremendously good aim as well, apparently, according to Darwin. Um, uh, Joe, what about you? Have you observed uh, the possibility of humour in the field? So I talking about the dung I was wondering about the habit that chimps have of um, let's say it's water but but going over if they're in captivity in a sanctuary for example filling their mouth with water mm. waiting for you to come along and then spitting it all over you and so you could interpret that in many ways but they're having fun I don't know if it's comedy but they're really having fun um, and we also have examples of when they don't like someone, yeah, lots of dung. Um, but I don't think, I, I don't know if that's comedy. It makes me laugh. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> like Kat no, says, no, I don't see no. them laugh, but they plan it. They, you know, you can you can watch a chimp, chimpanzee go over to the um, to their drink, um, drinking hose and fill them out with water and then just sit and wait <laughs> for someone to come along. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think the prank, pranksterism. I like that. I like the fact there is uh, the, there's tricksters and pranksters. Uh, <laughs> in those great forests. Um, this is uh, well. I suppose we almost talked about this before. From Haggis Lover would like to know. Uh, and again, I'll start with you on this, Cat. Do do primates have better immune systems than us? Uh, Haggis Lover was in particular feeling like <laughs> if I drank fresh water out of a puddle, I presume I'd be on the toilet for a week. Uh, no. But I presume it depends on different surroundings. So, so Cat, what do you reckon? That that would so. We did, a, we did a study recently where we were trying to get anecdotal descriptions of disgust reactions in apes, where we basically asked a lot of primatologists whether or not they'd ever seen their apes do anything that looked like they were responding with disgust. So they've stepped in poo, how do they react? Um, well, they usually grab a leaf and frantically brush it off their foot. So there's lots of different ways in which they seem to respond with something like disgust. Um, so they seem to have some mechanisms that are shared with us to avoid some of those contaminants. But what I found really entertaining about it was that we asked a lot of primatologists and what we found were the sealed primatologists. We actually ended up having to tack on a questionnaire to assess the threshold of disgust response in the person answering the questionnaire. Because <laughs> it turns out that if you spend your life running around a rainforest and you've dropped a high value food item like a uh, piece of chocolate on the floor the three second rule gets bent to to its absolute limits because there is no more chocolate coming anytime soon so i suspect that 
are a our responses to these things are, are just really shaped by our immediate environment and that's going to be our physical environment that we're living in what are we exposed to it's going to be our behavioral environment what do we choose to avoid and what do we risk or risk exposing ourselves to so i don't think that this is necessarily that other primates have better immune systems than we do so much as depending on what kind of a world we live in our immune or competence might have become strengthened or flexible or adapted to whatever world we're living in. Joe, have you observed much in terms of understanding the different the different uh, immune systems of, of various different monkeys, apes, humans? Yeah, so I think this takes us back to the question about um, COVID and diseases and respiratory infections and so on. Um, so I don't think we have, I don't think there's a, a better immune system in one species than another. I think there are different immune systems. And so that's the like the classic internal immune system where we 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 produce um, killer cells and so on against a, an antigens, but also maybe behavioural. So what a, a lot of what Kat was talking about is our behavioural immune system that we, you know, we would or wouldn't drink out of a puddle or or step in something or eat that chocolate. Um, so I, I think it's more that there are differences, and we know that in in the way. So chimpanzees die of respiratory infections that we barely notice, and yet they seem to live for a very long time with simian immunodeficiency virus, whereas um, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus without drugs, kills us pretty quickly. Uh, mandrels seem to have two simian immunodeficiency viruses um, with which they just live. Then we don't have yet any evidence that it makes them ill at all. I don't think that's they've got a stronger immune system. I think it's because they have evolved for longer with that in, with that virus. Brilliant, thank you. Have you both got a couple more minutes? Just because I know we started late, and that was my fault. Uh, just we got a few more questions. Brilliant. Uh, the um, I'm not going to ask you why can't we use seawater to water our gardens. That's from Nicole. Nicole, we will definitely ask that when Helen's back. That's very much a Helen question. And uh, so back in two weeks, Nicole, we'll, we'll get to your question. This we've got a couple on language, which Anna would like to know. And we, again, we kind of touched on this very slightly at the beginning. Do all chimpanzees have the same language, or are there different dialects amongst regions? Cat. Um, that's a brilliant question and I can't tell you the answer yet but hopefully soon. Um, so my a lot of my research has been on chimpanzee and great ape communication but what we've typically done up to now is go super in-depth on one group and so here in the Bodongo forest we've got 17 years of data on their gestures and that has told me an awful lot about um, chimpanzee gestural communication and I can compare that to what's been reported in other places and we think that the basic signals available to you when you're born are shared across a species so shared across chimps shared across bonobos if you're very closely related like chimps and bonobos are you've got a lot of those in common but they actually share a lot with other African apes like gorillas and it would expand out from there but you could say the same thing about spoken language in humans. So all of the sounds that we make in spoken languages all around the world are a set of phonemes and any baby when they're born can make any of them. What shapes our language and our dialect is our experience of using them and being exposed to other people using them. And so if you grow up in a northern European country, you're probably going to have a certain set of phonemes that are repeated to you on a regular basis and you'll retain those and some of the other ones will just drop out to the point that it becomes really difficult to produce or hear them so I know when I first went to um, East Asian countries and heard languages like Thai or Vietnamese which use a lot of tonal phonemes I found that really difficult to discriminate the sounds because I hadn't been exposed to it but if I'd gone there as a baby I'd have been fine and we think possibly we might see something similar in the great apes so they've got well talking about great apes because that's what i know about but there's no reason to suspect it might not be the same in other primates and so if they've got this repertoire of signals that everybody has access to but they're using them uh, amongst themselves and they live for a very long time and they've got tightly knit social groups then one of the projects that i'm currently working on is we've taken our methodology from bodongo and we're going into um, I think we're up to about four or five groups of every subspecies of African ape. And we're basically going to ask that question. Can we see dialect? Can we see differences in accent emerging? If we've got one 
um, mean if we've got two gestures that tend to mean the same things maybe you use the handshake gesture and I use the arm reach gesture but actually we achieve the same goal just as having you know two words for the same sort of thing in, in a lot of human languages might exist so um, hopefully I can give you a better answer to that in a couple more years. Brilliant. So we'll skip Abigail's question, which is about, uh, and this is an interesting, could, could a gorilla effectively communicate with a bonobo? Mm. Uh, no reason to think that they couldn't if they wanted to. The question would be, would they want to? Probably not. Um, but the gorillas and bonobos, at least in their gestures, their vocalizations are very different, but their gestures, they have about 70 or 80 percent of the same gestures. Um, we don't know that the same gesture means the same thing, but we know that in chimps and bonobos, the same gesture tends to mean the same thing. So if those two species ever met, there's a reasonable chance if they wanted to, that they could have a little chat with each other. Thank you. Uh, Joe, this is an interesting. This is from uh, Cox C, not Cox B. Uh, I read an article recently that suggested ancient non-human primates may have migrated huge distances across the sea. Is this accurate from our current understanding? I don't know how much that also is in terms of the subaquatic ape theory, whether that comes in there or not. Oh, so those, yeah, they are slightly different things. But the um, overseas migration, uh, yeah, um, it does seem, it's heavily debated in biogeography. Bio and how, so for example, how primates got to Madagascar and where they came from when they went, got to Madagascar. Uh, there, there's a lovely cartoon that appears in lots of textbooks of a, a fairly small lemur on a raft with a paddle. Um, so there's that question. There's also the question of how primates got to South America, South and Central America. Um, and the most recent finding that I know about that is they found a fossil that suggests that primates got to South America twice. And yet yeah, South America is, is a hugely long way from where they must have come from. They must have come from mainland Africa, it seems. Um, so, yeah, there's this hypothesis. There are lots of kind of sub hypotheses that belong to it that meet, that involve large rafts of vegetation breaking off, and we and we know this happens um, in in rainforest rivers, for example. You do get large rafts in at the mouth of the river as it goes into the ocean, and then if you study ocean currents, it's possible that those rafts could be could float across. Um, these, but they are vast distances. Um, so I think it really comes down to whether or not you can wrap your head around it. Some scientists can't, and so they have other explanations, and some just accept that if enough small rafts broke off or large rafts broke off and floated across the current tree, they would float, float across the ocean, eventually they might have a found a population of primates. It's, it's wonderful to think of. But yeah, right. it's a hard one to ever test. Well, the, the nice thing about all of these is always at the end, all the youngest people watching this realise that uh, it's perfectly safe to go into primatology because it's definitely not near being finished. You know, it's one of those, oh, I won't go into that science. They've nearly done that. Oh, hang on a no. minute. This one's got a good 50 years plus in it, probably a couple of centuries or more. Um that is brilliant. Thank you. We've got uh, Cookie 47, by the way. Sorry we haven't dealt with your question. We will do that another time because it's a genetics question. We'll do it on genetics special. Uh, Damien, his final question. Anyone know why sea monkeys are called sea monkeys? Because they look nothing like monkeys. Now, I think that's merely the, the monetizing of freeze-dried shrimp, as far as I know. But uh, if either of you have any answers on that. <laughs> Everything is improved by adding monkey to the end of it, so... It really is. You're entirely. I. 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 I think it's humour and uh, freeze dried shrimp and everything in between and beyond that. Uh, Kat, where can people go to find out uh, the kind of work that you're involved with at, at the moment? I know there's some some great stuff up on YouTube and some lovely short films and things like that. And I would recommend. I mean, I know Monkey Cage. Like, oh, of course, I'm going to recommend it. But it was a really enjoyable uh, conversation, extended conversation that, that that we all had on on language there. Uh, you can find out a bit more about us at our lab group website. So we've got wildminds.ac.uk and greatapedictionary.com is where all of our ape communication work lives. Brilliant. Thank you. And Joe, just a reminder again of where people can go on uh, on Facebook and also the, the website. Yes, please look at um, Primate Society of Great Britain, which is psgb.org. Uh, so that's for anybody interested in primates uh, in Great Britain and elsewhere. And have a look at savegabonsprimates.org. 
um, if you speak French or have a look at it in a little bit when I have translated it. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. I'm sorry that we kept you waiting before. Uh, and uh, also, I was going to mention this week we've got, I think, next uh, the Tips for Existence, current one's Michael Pollan. Next one will be uh, Natalie Haynes with her Tips for Existence using the classical world. And uh, I think probably a very interesting, we haven't recorded it yet, but a conversation about Plato's cave and why Plato actually came up. It may well have just been that he was very short sighted, which really changes his philosophy and his disappointment with it. So we'll be dealing with that. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what our next book shall be, but it may well be uh, Rupert Thompson, who is a, a fascinating novelist. I hope you all have uh, wonderful Sundays. Uh, thank you to our producer, Trent. Thank you again to Cat and Joe. And uh, we won't see you next week, but we'll see you the week after. <laughs>